<laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome. As everybody comes in, thanks for joining us. It's great to see you. Um, Sorry for the delay. We had a little, there's some a few issues with Zoom. I think we might actually be in the process of breaking Zoom. No, we're not actually breaking Zoom. Um, we are just super excited to be here and to be with Susan Conley and Lily King tonight to celebrate this new book. Um, and uh, it's gonna be a great conversation. Um, for those of you who I don't know, my name is Gibson Faye LeBlanc and I'm uh, with the Main Writers and Publishers Alliance. And on behalf of MWPA and Mechanics Hall and Print, a bookstore, we're so pleased to kick off the book launch for Susan Conley's new novel, Landslide, and, for, with a, and to have a conversation with Susan and Lily King. Um, I have three quick reminders before we get started. First of all, um, this event will work best if you're in speaker view. So up in your top right corner of your Zoom screen, you should, you should note that you're in speaker view. Um, and second, print, of course, is our official bookseller tonight. Um, we'll be dropping a link in a moment into the chat so that you can buy yourself a personalized or signed copy of Landslide. Or maybe somehow you didn't get a copy of Lily King's Writers and Lovers and you want to grab that as well or Susan's previous book or one of Lily's previous books, that's all happening at print um, tonight, tomorrow, in the next few days, whenever you need it. Um, and the last but not least, um, just a reminder that both Mechanics Hall and MWPA are membership organizations. So please join us. Um, MWPA offers workshops and conferences and events all year long. Um, and though we can't be at Mechanics Hall right now in that beautiful space, um, many of us remember fondly um, being there just about a year ago for Lily's book release of Writers and Lovers, um, one of the, the final events before, before the pandemic really hit. Um, and you can get curbside pickup for your books from Mechanics Hall's, li Mechanic Hall's, li Mechanics Hall's library. Um, so you might want to check that out. Um, so uh, I'm going to get out of here um, because you didn't come to see me um, and neither did I. I'm not here to see me. Um, so first, I want to welcome Lily King, um, who is the award winning author of five novels. Her 2014 novel, Euphoria, won the Kirkus Award and the New England Book Award, among many others. Um, and of course, her most recent, which I mentioned, is Writers and Lovers, which is on so many best of the year lists for 2020 that I don't have time to list them all, New York Times, NPR, Washington Post, et cetera. Um, and it's going to be in paperback next week, from what I hear. That's the word on the street, so you should grab that. Um, and of course, our guest of honor tonight, Susan Conley. Susan and I um, first met way back in 2006, a year or two after she and two other writers founded The Telling Room, and we helped work on that organization and build it together which is now, of course, a thriving beacon for young writers. And Susan is the author of five critically acclaimed novels, um, or five critically acclaimed books, several of them novels, um, including Landslide, this one, and her previous one, Elsie Come Home, was a most anticipated book, or best book, at Oprah, Marie Claire, Amazon, Huffington Post, and other places. So without further ado, Susan and Lily, thank you so much for doing this. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you so much, Gibson. And thank you everyone far and wide for coming. Um, Gibson just did a really great job of um, thanking our hosts. So I'll just do a quick shout out to our hosts again. Um, Gibson, who is an incredible executive director of Maine Writers and Publishers, and they create real community in this state for writers. So I'm indebted to Maine Writers and Publishers. Um, and then to Mechanics Hall um, here in Portland, where we would be tonight having a large party if we could be. Um, and thanks to their incredible director, Annie Leahy. Um, it is used to be, we call it a, a secret, a secret cultural treasure, but um, now it's becoming this incredible supporting space for makers and artists and writers and readers. And um, I'm indebted to them. And then to print because they create a home for writers in Maine and they've created such a home for landslide. So I'm so grateful to them. 
And then to my um, beloved um, Knopf team, um, Carol Barron, my dear friend and long-term editor, um, I have no book without her, nor do I without my amazing agent, Stephanie Cabot, and then my incredibly talented publicist, Emily Reardon. So I'm so grateful to Knopf. Um, I'm grateful to Ben Martins, who is the executive director of the Maine Fishermen's um, uh, Association, um, Maine Coast Fish Fishermen's Association. Um, he's been so helpful to me in um, research for this book and to my um, beloved writers group. They're, they're the ones who taught me how to write novels. Mm -hmm. Anya Hansen, Caitlin Guttel, and Lily King. So. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, welcome. I hope that people are, are in or getting in. I know there are some technical problems, so um, hopefully we've given you enough time to to come on in. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you to all of you, MWPA and Print and Mechanics Hall. Um, I'm just gonna show you the book first because it is so beautiful. I, you all need to know this. Like it's one of those books that you touch it and you're like, oh, I need to have this. I need to own this book. It is, it's like the perfect size. It's the texture and look at how beautiful that is. Anyway, um, yeah. I know this book very well because I am in Susan's writer's group. And so I saw it when it was like um, 195 pages or maybe even less and, and have, have watched it evolve. And uh, it is, every time I read it, um, I just get really thrilled all over again because it is a gorgeous book about a family in crisis that, and the tension just like ramps up and ramps up and, you know, and it, it goes in unexpected places and but there's so much um kind of humor and love and uh and there's really something for everybody in this book anyway um what we're gonna do is susan and i are gonna chat for a little bit and then i'm gonna ask her to read for one or two minutes and then we're gonna chat a little bit more and then you're gonna see a movie <laughs> for um about four minutes and then we're gonna open it up to audience q a so um hi Sus. Hi, Lily. How are you? Happy Pub Day. Thank you so much. So happy um, to be here. Congratulations. Huge congratulations. So I always like to start with, you know, my biggest question when anybody writes anything is, where exactly were you when you got the first flash of a spark of an idea or a moment for this book? And, and, and what was it? And what did you do? So this book really came to me, the real spark came to me when I was driving up the coast of Maine from Portland to Wiscasset. I was actually meeting um, a grad student there um, from my Stone Coast grad program. Huge shout out to Stone Coast tonight. Um, and we were just gonna have tea and the Fleetwood Mac song came on the radio and we have a thing, we Mainers, that you can't go a day without hearing a Fleetwood Mac song on the radio. <laughs> um, and I started singing at the top of my lungs because I grew up on Fleetwood Mac in You're Maine. You're driving into Wiscasset now? Where I, are we I, I was driving and I sang and I sang and then I thought, oh my God, my two children, my two boys would hate it so much if <laughs> they were in this car with me. And I'd been wanting to write a novel about Maine and I wanted to write about where those fishing trawlers had gone that I grew up watching um, in Maine. And I wanted to write about boys and boys rich inner lives. And when I, I pulled over in Wiscasset and I scribbled all my notes about these two boys in a car listening to Fleetwood Mac. And then I actually thought, well, there, I've got it. I've got the novel now. I know, I, I got so excited. I, I knew the emotional kind of um, curiosity of the book then. Oh, that's so, that's so interesting. And then, all right, so you wrote that down and then, and then do you remember what happened after that? Like when you initially had this idea, what, what do you think your, your interests were? And then did it expand? Anything surprising happen as it, as it evolved? 
Oh God. Yeah. So much surprising happens. As know, it's really hard to put it together. Isn't it? When you go back and like, let's evolve. Um, so much happened. Um, let's see. Um, I wanted to write a comedy and it's a joke in my writer's group that, that I wanted to write a comedy and, you know, a lot of really hard things happen in this novel. I wanted to write a truly a love letter and like a true testament to my love of Maine and how Maine is part of my DNA. And I, I think if anything, I have succeeded at that. Mm. Um, I feel like I'm, I'm proud that this book shows a real Maine, the Maine I knew growing up, a rural Maine, a working class Maine, a fishing class Maine. Um, so what the, the novel kept doing is it just kept deepening and deepening and expanding. Mm -hmm. um, so it became about everything I thought, but, but then more, you know, because this is the thing about novels, right, Lily? <laughs> mm -hmm, yeah, it's true. And, and so let's, uh, let's stay on Maine for a second because in your novels and in your memoir, you know, Maine, Maine was always, has always been important. It's always been home, but usually the characters in question are, or the character in question is sort of far away from that home. And, uh, and, and now you've like er, gone right toward it. And, you know, this whole novel takes place in Maine, except for a little side trips to Canada, which are not really happy trips. <laughs> but um, I'm wondering, I'm wondering, you know, what exactly did you want to, what exactly did you want to capture and, and, um, and how did it feel to finally be writing head on about Maine? Ah, oh, God, that's a great question. So um, I wasn't ready to write about Maine yet. Um, so I, I, I did, I worked my way to it. Um, I think Gibson said in my last novel, my character in um, Elsie Come Home actually comes home to Maine in the very end for a little while. And it was very pleasurable to write about Maine then. And I thought, oh, this feels really good because I'd been writing about Paris and China and really far away places. Um, it's hard to write about a place that you know really well though yeah. and love. You, you want to do it justice. Um, and also most of this novel takes place on the coast a lot of it takes place on a very, very small island. And I was confronted early on with how many ways I would have to describe the ocean. How many <laughs> metaphors for the light and the sea without being cliche. Um, so I really, um, really took, um, took my time with that. Sometimes it would just be a day where I had a, a paragraph where I thought I had really nailed a, a metaphor um, and then I would be pleased. Um, and I knew that people, so oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. A lot of the people that I know from Maine um, are, you know, such important people to me. And I thought, well, they'll probably read this book. So uh, can I do, can I do Maine justice? And that island, when you say island, like, you know, small island, we all have an idea of small island, but this island has their house on it right as far as i can tell there's there's no there's no other house right yeah no it's a tiny little island and it yeah. came down through the um the the sort of husband in the, my novel kit's family um just a speck of an island with an old fishing shack on it that they they no one really knows how they came to own it <laughs> or if they own it <laughs> yeah um we you i think it's time to read Ah. Um, would you read just a, a couple of pages just to give us a little flavor? And then I I'm... shall. Okay, thank you. I will read a very, very little, little short thing. Just um, here we are. I've taken the cover off the book so it doesn't make a lot of noise, but um, <laughs> here we are. Um, I thought I would take us to Maine and I would take us to the island and you'll just meet the two boys. And this is very short. And this is um, Jill, the um, narrator of this novel, talking. Okay, and I think we are on, what are we on? We are on page 48, 49. So we're, we're, we're maybe a third, fifth of the way into the book. Our dock sits in a tiny cove near the point of the spear, protected from currents and tides by the ledges. 
To get down to it, we have to take the wooden ramp kit built over the rocks and go past the wild rose bushes and sumac and cedar scrub. The Duchess won't start again today, but Sam keeps pulling on the engine rope until I'm sure he's flooded it. I live in a police state, he says, the way you're always watching me. That should be illegal, Mom, for you to go on my Instagram. I'm up in the bow where I want to remind him not to flood the engine again and that years ago he let me follow him on Instagram, but I stopped myself from saying anything. We had another killing frost last night, but the potatoes are all dug now and the gardens are covered with seaweed. I'm not afraid of the cold. If anything, I'm afraid of Sam because he isn't in control of himself anymore that now that his father's gone. Your dad almost died. This is what I told the boys when I first explained the accident to them. Your father almost died in the boat fire. I told them this because it's true and also so that the boys would remember to be nicer to me. I don't really mean that. I told them so they could understand how serious things were. I read an article in Kitt's hospital room last week about a painter in Los Angeles named Laura Owens, who had a retrospective at the Whitney in New York at the age of 47. My mother always told me the whole world was waiting for me. And in this way, I was not one of the girls whose appetite was taken away. But who gets a Whitney retrospective at 47? The question for me is how to survive on the island with the boys and remain chill. The question blows up almost every day. My sister-in-law Candy says you wait it out and the boys come back to you. She says it can take maybe five years. I don't know if I can wait that long. Laura Owens kept a journal in her 20s called How to Be the Greatest Artist in the World with a 14 point checklist with things like think big on it and do not be afraid of anything and say very little. I've decided to try to implement the say very little strategy as a new communication tool with the wolves. My hope is that by withholding, I'll receive signs that my little boys are in there be behind the faces of the imposters. Shit, Sam says and kicks the black casing of the Evinrude, then kicks the side of the boat. Please don't do that, I say. Don't do what? He kicks the side of the boat again and looks at me. Swear. But what I really mean is don't kick the boat. And even that's not true. What I want to say is don't seal yourself off in your pain and don't smoke joints in cars outside McDonald's and don't die. And where are you these days? Where are you? I'll stop there. Very nice. Very nice. I love that. I remember you reading that in writer's group, you know, when before we'd seen, yeah, I mean, yeah, before we'd seen anything. It's really, really great. Those those boys, just so, so beautifully done. Um, Kit is also beautifully done. We get to go up and visit Kit in the hospital um, a few times in Halifax, uh, where he's kind of stuck in with very serious injuries. And the most striking thing is, is that, I mean, so, you know, the, I mentioned the tension ramping up and, and uh, you know, it starts with the boys and the teenage boys and, um, you know, there's some pot smoking and there's one who has a, has, has a girlfriend and wants to be alone with her and what does he want to do with her and, you know, um, and then, I, of course, there's Kit having the accident and he's far away, he's eight hours away, it's a very long drive and she needs to stay with the boys because she feel like, feels like they're not doing well then she needs to be with her husband who's also not doing well. And, and she's split in a lot of ways. And she finally goes up um, and, uh, and, when she, and she, when she gets there, she sees that he's like, his mind is on this loop. You know, he's, um, he's become sort of un, unlike him in a way, quite emotional, but also um, very focused on, fishing of the fish the fishing industry in Maine and so one of the first things he says to her is whoever thought that fishing would end in my lifetime and um and you just you feel this man's you know um suffering from from um not the necessarily just the lack of work and the lack of money 
um, that's coming in, but that as well, but also that that fishing was his destiny. He comes from a long line of fishermen and his mother gave him that boat. She, she died when he was 10, but she left him that boat. And, and so there's so much emotion tied up with that. Uh, and I don't really have a question. <laughs> but I just wanted to say that it's just so beautifully done. And if you wanted to talk about Kit for a little <laughs> bit, we wouldn't mind. Because he's very sexy too, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Lily has always had a crush on Kit. I have. It's so true. Don't tell my husband. I think he's listening though. I do have to share that. Um, what do I want to say? I want to say that um, fishing uh, is something that that um, is the lifeblood of the state, and it really was part of the landscape when I was growing up. There were the there, there was that fleet of trawlers and then there was that fleet of trawlers. And I watched that um, start to really, really fade. Um, although there's, there's a lot of new energy around um, fishing and fishing um, was, you know, sustainably in this state now. Um, how tied families are to their boats. Oh my God, we could talk about that for, for days, right? And the idea that he would lose his boat, lose his home, it's his home away from home. Um, so the novel, yeah, really explores that. Yeah. Really try to get at that a lot. And that boat is named after her. It's the Jillian Lynn, right? And, uh, and it's so interesting because Jillian, she, she almost feels like she comes from away just because she comes from a mill town, you know, two hours north. And, um, and she has her own relationship with Maine and, and actually her own kind of sense of destiny. And so there's this really great quote about um, Jillian having grown up wanting to leave Maine. And so she says, I already knew I'd leave Maine. I didn't know how or when, but it was my destiny in a way. In Maine, you were either staying or going. Both required their own set of skills and risks, and you had to choose. I think that really, you're getting, I mean, that, that really captures something about this state. I mean, there's so many strange things about this state or, or, or very, very particular things about this state. Um, and that feels particular. No other place that I've lived is like that so much. Oh, that's cool to to really think about and to know um, the staying and the going. It was it was part of the vernacular of even high school. You are you started to know who felt like they were going to go and who was going to stay. And then, if you're a Mainer and you're out of Maine, as we all know, those of us who are Mainers here, you you either you're deciding whether you'll come back. You're always deciding whether you'll come back and when. Um, and I think a lot of people who who've just um, visit here or to feel like they are um, home when they get here. Yeah. You know, there's things about this state that call to people and there's a reason why people want to be here. It's very, very cold here today though. <laughs> very <laughs> icy, very cold, very dramatic in the best way. Um, yeah. yeah. It, is, it is funny. I mean, I came here when I was 15 and I was like, I need to live here. You know, my daughter grew up here and her college, all of her college essays started, my younger daughter started, um, I grew up, I grew up in rural Maine and, you know, basically I need to get out, let me out, you know, and I'm like, you didn't grow up in rural Maine, <laughs> but to her, you know, it's very funny how that is. Um, and then we have the boys and I just want to, I just, I love this part where Jillian says, this is what I often think about Sam. If I just take him more seriously, I can solve him. But then I run out of time or get distracted and the puzzle of him starts over again. I thought that was really, really interesting. And then just another line about the boys. The big thing I wanna to report to Kit but can never find the right words to say on the phone is that the boys and I are not the same person. We never were. Sometimes it's like we're meeting one another for the first time and they're not my friends or even my allies. Hello, I imagine saying to them, hello, I am your mother. And I just, I thought that, that, that really captured, you know, she has such a lovely quirky little way of trying to puzzle through this, you know, 
um, the enigma of being a mother, you know, <laughs> and, and, and having your kids be at all these different ages and different stages and, and, and how quick, how, how at first it does feel like they sort of are you. And then as they grow up, they, they obviously have to individuate and separate from you and how strange that is. And I feel like you're really capturing that. That's so well. Oh, thank you. You know, I think for my, I, I set a very clear intention with this book, right? I wanted to ask about the inner lives, particularly of boys. And Jill is this feminist mom. Can she raise, you know, feminist evolved boys, boys who are not part of the problem? But, you know, um, the leave taking that boys have to do to individuate, <clears throat> you know, in the, at least in this book, was markedly different than than girls and it's 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 really the, what I really wanted to do is I wanted to try to honor that hidden like the hidden inner life of boys and what I call like the great selling out of boys in our society so that boys are like are menacing and groups of boys in particular um, are are you know menacing and um, it's just such an incredible miss there's just such an incredible miss for, for, you know, boy vulnerability across race and class and, um, you know, occupation. And, you know, you just see it again and again. And, and um, I, I really was trying to explore that. So um, the puzzling, yeah, Jill is trying to figure out, it's like a math problem. Like how can she connect with these boys, these wolves as she calls them as they start to leave her, they still, there's all that push and pull going on with the mother and the sons. They need her, but they're leaving her. Mm -hmm. um, and then just the pure comedy too, just the pure comedy of being a mother to these wolves who just wanna eat a lot of food and have zero interest in her, her inner life. Mm -hmm. So then she wants to do that, hello, I'm your mother announcement every now and then. Like, do you remember me? Hello. <laughs> And then there's the great kind of, you know, uh, the other, there's posting on Instagram about smoking pot. And then there's like, just wanting to cuddle, you know, on the bed with, the, you know, getting back rub or something like that, you know, and there's just like, the, she's just constantly, you know, um, just, you know, she's always kind of a little destabilized because she's trying to figure out, you know, what they need and how she can provide that and how she can still like stay herself and actually have a have have her own self despite all of that um and then and then so the boys are completely oblivious when when they go up to the hospital and uh and one of my favorite characters i just want to talk a little bit about her origins where she came from um in your mind you know and what stage she arrived there's this character named marsh and she shows up i'm not ruining anything because she shows up really early on in the book, in the hospital room. She's visiting her husband, you know, who nearly died. And then suddenly this woman she's never met before and a little dog come in and, and she sees this little, Jillian sees this little smile that happens between her husband and this young woman. And her whole world is yet again, like just thrown completely for a loop because she does not expect this and what is going on between these two. And, uh, and, and it's just a really another layer of tension in this novel. Um, and I, I, yeah, I'm wondering where she came from. Yeah, Marsh, Marsh was always, she, she showed up early in the drafting of this novel. You know, this novel came to me very quickly in its rough first draft. Mm -hmm. It really did. It, it was like I'd been waiting, waiting to write about Maine and about that landscape. But Marsh came early and um, she, she created all kinds of trouble. And we know, we know we're onto something good, right? When, when we have trouble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she is great. She, I just love, I really love those scenes so much. Um, should we talk about the title briefly? Oh, sure. Yeah, great, great idea. Um, you struggled with actually naming it Landslide. 
And uh, I just want to say, just, you know, I was an <laughs> early advocate of that title. <laughs> Many texts urging you on, but, um, but I, you know, I, it, it, it works in a lot of ways. Yeah, no, I, I, I love the title. And, and of course, it's the Stevie Nicks, um, the Stevie Nicks song, um, Landslide, which really opens the book. So um, it's an obvious choice. I love the title now. I was just talking with, with Carol, my editor, um, Saturday about how much we both love the title now. Um, and um, I, yeah, so it feels really natural now. And also this idea of landscape, um, Carl Little, who's such a wonderful writer and lives here in Maine, wrote a, a lovely review of the book for The Working Waterfront. And he, I think he called the review, the title is something like, oh, till the landslide takes, takes it down like he he quoted the song and then he talked about the what i was working on in the book with the landslide of change coming to maine and coming to fishermen and climate change right and the landslide of um bodily and psychological change for for teenage boys mm -hmm. and mothers having to let go of teenage boys so suddenly it's amazing to me, and I know there are a lot of writers here tonight um, and, and people that are finishing first novels. And it's amazing how if you can give yourself over to a, what I call a narrative conceit or a framing device like Landslide, it can do enormous work for you. So then mm -hmm. everywhere you look, you see all these opportunities to explore this, this frame of Landslide. And similarly for me, this idea of being islanded and being, you know, isolated and yeah Jill's from a mill town she doesn't actually fit into the fishing town and um islands and and that geography and physicality of islands also really worked for me um and so once I got my landslide frame Lily and I got the island mm -hmm. I felt really anchored in the novel I felt like I could go places and really explore more emotional territory because I had my anchors Mm -hmm. um those narrative conceit um anchors yeah that's great and then and then can we just go back to you being a poet <laughs> um and when i met you in 97 uh you know you were a very committed and accomplished poet and um i i was wondering if you could just briefly talk about that transition and also you know i know we we talked about this idea of you know genre fluidity and and also the the um, the in by the sea moment is always one of my favorites. If you wanted to share that, um, <laughs> it happened. Um, I, I, it's funny. I wrote poetry for so long, and I did all of my studies in poetry, and but I it was it was an emotional curiosity that was calling to me. I suspect now, and I haven't thought of this yet, or I hadn't said haven't said this yet, but we women in nineteen in the 80s in college, we're getting fed pretty much white men in as, as literature majors, but poetry was, was the territory of more women and women of color and women saying audacious things about their bodies and their sex lives and their hearts and their souls. And so I just devoured poetry for a really long time and it gave me permission to take risks and say these things that were that I really wanted to say. And then as I grew older and I probably grew more emboldened and I got more courageous, I knew that I, I had a novel coming in, inside me. And then I did, I went, I, I can't, my husband and I went, went away on this odd thing. I don't know why or how we ended up in a hotel here in Maine. Our kids were and really small. Really we small. started a writer's group, right? And yeah. you said you were gonna write poetry and we were all like, okay. I was the one poet in the group. And then I went away and I scribbled pages and pages and pages of a novel. And I think I came to you all in the writer's group and said, okay, I seem to be writing a novel now. Um, that yeah, great. that was so great. Yeah, then I never really looked back. Although I will say, no, I did look back. I look back all the time. Poetry infuses everything that I hmm. write. And um, I did a sort of poetry collaboration with the photographer Winky Lewis that stop here, this is the place is really prose poems. Um, and I just had so much fun teaching lyricism at Stone Coast and really I just gave the students poetry all week. Um, so um, I, I feel like if someone told me that landslide 
has has a has a has poetry in it if it feels lyrical at times that would be the greatest compliment to me it really would be then i would feel like i was doing language like the extraordinary tony morrison has said you know called challenged writers to to do when they're writing mm -hmm. to, to do language um yeah. so yeah yeah you do it really well oh thank um, you is it is it film time gib Yes, it is. Yeah, I was giving it a, a few extra minutes because we got started a little late, but and it's also just lovely to hear you two talk. Um, and poet, we got poetry in there too, so <laughs> I, I was happy about that. Um, uh, I want to. Yes, we have a, a wonderful surprise here, a, a, a trailer for the book that was uh, made by um, local filmmaker and star uh, Sean Mishaw, and there's there's several cameos that that folks should watch out for including um the novelist sarah bronstein um playing a, playing a lead role so i'm going to start that video right this second it's late afternoon at the end of a long october we're halfway down the peninsula when the Fleetwood Mac song comes on. It's in a challenging register for me, so I'm almost crowing while I sing. And I feel for a moment like Stevie Nicks is a close friend, like she knows me. I tell the wolves, could they please let me listen to the whole thing? because Sam, the younger one, has a bad habit of changing the station. I tell the wolves I was raised on Stevie Nicks. I was raised on Stevie Nicks. Mom, he says in his deadpan, I already, I already know about you growing up on Stevie Nicks. Every time I turn on the radio, it's Stevie the Good Witch of the West Nicks. The thing is, Mom, I don't want to grow up on Fleetwood Mac like you did. I can't tell if the hair is a joke or a really bad fashion statement that involves hardly ever washing it. But I just grin at him and move my head to the beat because at least he's speaking. Sometimes my son's silence in the car is flammable. He's 16, gangly with poking collarbones like little car door handles. He wants to be a professional basketball player, but will settle for rock musician. His face has grown long and gaunt, so he doesn't look like himself, but the person he's in the process of becoming. I tell myself it's a beautiful face. It's important to tell myself that many things about teenage boys are beautiful, so I don't panic. I love this song, and the boys in this car being forced to listen to this song. I turn it up really loud, the way I used to, when I was a different person and did not have two wolves. That's pretty cheesy, Mom. <laughs> Mom, the voice. Mom, please. Charlie's trying to sound like he and I are the adults in the car. He's our moral police. 17 going on something like 33. He has my husband's dark hair. I'm trying not to think about my husband. Tall and lanky with steady blue eyes. My loner with a thousand friends. Kit has left me on our island to fish almost every week since I married him. He'd been gone three months before the accident, and I think the boys and I have missed him so much we cannot say. The song on the radio is about a woman who climbs a mountain at the end of a love affair and sees her reflection in the snow-covered hills and becomes less afraid. For many months, I've wanted to be less afraid. I'm not allowed to talk to the boys about how much I miss him. I'm not allowed to talk to the boys about my dread or my worry or any of my emotions, really. This isn't because the boys aren't emotional. 
It's just that no outward expression of emotion is sanctioned in this phase of wolf development. I tell them, this whole Fleetwood Mac album is so good. Never forget it. Never. Never, he says, such a funny boy. Never. And changes the station. But I've already won the afternoon because he's still talking. <laughs> nice love it <laughs> amazing great job <laughs> oh so good so, so good God. so great yeah great to have that in the middle right here um I'm so grateful to all those actors um the the shout out to the to the teenage boys shout out to joey ansel mullen and harry Millspa, and of course sarah bronstein mm -hmm. and sean dear sean it's work of of great, great genius. So we have some questions, um, and folks who are who are uh, on the call with us, uh, feel free to throw some more into the chat. I'm sure we'll have time for, for uh, well, we'll have time for what we have time for. Um, our first one um, is. Uh, Susan, I know you mentioned the idea came to you first, but which character came to you first? Which character did you struggle with writing? Ah, um, so the narrator of the book is Jill and she's in her late forties and she came first, but her son, Sam and Charlie were very, very close seconds and they, they were together. Um, I would say that Kit was the hardest to write, um, the, the man, the husband and father, but he wasn't that hard, to be honest. He, I knew him, I wanted to know him better. Um, so really it was more, it was less about difficulty and more about just being, I'm gonna use that word generous with them, letting them talk, letting them go. Um, really like freeing the, the, the reins. Like I think sometimes we can try to control our plots as writers. And um, the more I let them go, the more they surprised me and the more vulnerable my characters got. So by the end, by the end, I was crying while I wrote scenes mm -hmm. and they were crying and they were admitting that they were really vulnerable, all of them actually. And that was very exciting for me, but that took, that took a year of me living with them on the page, you know, and letting them really talk to me. Um, yeah. That's great. Um, Carl Little, who you mentioned earlier, who's here with us. Um, yeah, Carl. He, uh, he asked um, how the cover came about. Um, he said, it's a remarkable image and he was curious how the cover came about. Oh, the cover. Okay. So the cover, I have the most amazing. Oh, yep. There we are. <laughs> so Knopf, I, I've, you know, I've been so incredibly um, lucky um, to have, this is my fourth book with Knopf and they have extraordinary covers, but there's something that goes on with me and covers at Knopf where it's like the designer has this sort of, she's inside my head. Um, because we don't have to work too hard. I mean, we, Carol and I, my beloved editor, we, we, we fooled around with this a bit, but this was the cover. This was the cover. Um, but what a cool thing, like landslides backwards. Um, and there's a sense of pleasure, but also possibly danger with the jumping, right? And this ocean feels really mean to me. Um, I have to tell you though, um, something happened today. It turns out the photographer is a man, a French man, and he lives in France. And he wrote me the most beautiful email today. 
today. Um, and he said, I'm so thrilled that my, my photograph is your cover and that's his nephew. Oh. And he asked me if I would inscribe a book to his nephew and mail it to them in France because they're so excited. Oh, that's so, so great. So it's a really cool question, Carl, that you asked. It has a nice story today. Yeah. 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 Um, here's, here's a question that I can appreciate um, from Laura Tupper, um, uh, who asks, how did your writing group influence the development of this novel? Ah, so my writing group, um, they uh, don't let anything, anything slide. They want um, great emotional risk taking. They want lots of um, unpacking of scenes. I always have a joke with my writer about my writer's group that um, my first book, which was a memoir, The Foremost Good Fortune, talks a lot about um, a mother actually and two boys in China, me. And then there's um, this really hard scene where the narrator is having a, a surgery in a cancer ward. And it's a really crazy scene. And I I, I, in the memoir draft I shared with my writers group, I, it went like this. And then I had the surgery and then I went home and I gave the draft to my writers group and I thought I had bared my soul. And they were like, Susan, this is very powerful, but you haven't written like the most important scene. Lily, do you remember that? <laughs> I do. And you were like, no, 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 no. Go, you need to go home and write that scene. It's yeah. always the scenes, you know, the, mo the, the most important scenes that you don't want to write, that you avoid, you know? Yeah. I was like, I don't want to write that scene. I have written so many hard scenes in this book. And my writer's group was like, no, you must go write that scene and then come back to us. <laughs> um, so that's what my writer's group is like. And we have wonderful sort of rhythm and structure. We really know how to talk about each other's work now, very, very honestly, what's working, what's not working. Um, and that's been going on for over 15 years. Um, and really it's, it's to their credit that I'm not a poet anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I have to acknowledge you two probably have are, are not able to keep up with this, but there was basically an explosion on the chat when after the movie the the tra trailer played, just people just reacting and going crazy. Um, several people asked when the movie comes out. Um, there was um, people agreeing with Lily that Kit is really hot, um, and, um, all sorts of stuff. So <laughs> you can read that later. Uh, so um, oh, that's great. Yeah, great, great stuff in there. Thanks everybody for for weighing in. Um, and uh, let's see. There's a question from Nadja um, who's wondering what are the distinctive differences between the two sons, and how did their contrast create conflict? Mm. So this was something that um, Carol Barron, my my editor, and was really so like incisive on and like how different they needed to be. And luckily they were very different to me. So early on one is described as a, um, as like a, um, he, he's like a mad scientist. He, he, he's a science, he just loves science but he, he has the most wrinkled shirts and he's just, he's just sort of a mess but he's a scientist, he's a mad scientist. Um, and he's very, in, he's very in love, he's falling in teen love. And so he has this whole experience of falling in love that Sam, the younger boy and the mother Jill are just watching and like in shock that he, he's leaving them because he's in love. And then Sam is um, willing to say anything to his mom. And he, he's the one that she has to make sure sort of stays on the rail, doesn't go off the rails. And, and it's so fun to have a, a character that causes trouble because there's a lot of good comedy there too, um, you know, I think. And um, I say a lot that she had to learn how to speak boy, teenage boy. She has to learn how to speak teenage boy and she has to hustle because Sam is always one step ahead of her in terms of his like sort of um, subtext. Like I, I say, um, I, I, I have an essay I wrote recently where I talk about like this hidden language of boys and how so much of it is subtext and inference. And, and Jill's constantly trying to catch up to that. 
Um, but I just again and again made those boys as different as I could. One swears all the time. In fact, in fact, Carol and her amazing assistant Rob Shapiro, who I have not called out or done a shout out for, were like, "Ooh, I think that's a little too much swearing. Mm -hmm. There's just a lot of swearing going on." And and I wanted to be like, and Lily, you can attest to this, like. <laughs> there's so much swearing <laughs> in teenage land i couldn't even like begin to I, people would have been appalled at how much swearing <laughs> uh, so yeah that's great um speaking of teenage land um and boys um and bouchard wants to know have your boys read the book and if so what are their comments Ah, yes. No, they have not read the book yet. Um, they have not read the book yet. Um, they will. I have a funny joke about um, my, um, my older son, though, reading the book in draft form, in the very roughest, roughest draft form, I think two years ago. Um, I've shared this with you, Lily, where we were at my brother's for Christmas and he somehow took my laptop to watch a movie on Christmas Eve. And I went up to do that very emotional good night before Christmas Eve. And he was, he was crying, he was laughing so hard in this futon on the floor, just convulsed with laughter. And he said, is this your new novel? This, this stuff you've written in here about these two boys? And he was like, that's the worst writing that I have ever read. <laughs> He was like, that is just hysterical. You have it all wrong. And, and also, of course, he thought it was him. And of course, I said, it's not him because it's not him at all. But of course, in my mind, I was like, no, I think I have it right. Like, you're laughing really hard because I think I actually have touched a nerve. I, I think I have it right. Um, but it, it was a great moment. And that's all that he's read of, of the book so far. There, there will come a time. There's no rush, in my opinion. Absolutely. Um, Nancy is, and we just have time for a few more, I think. Um, Nancy is wondering how much of your own COVID experience informs the isolation narrative of Landslide? Uh, so the book was pretty much cooked before COVID hit. Although um, Lily and I were talking today and I said, God, could there, could there have been a more stressful summer? And there were a lot of reasons for that, including COVID. Um, but I did a, a major revision of the book in July. And that was, I think everyone that worked on the book can attest to how hard that was because it was like 900 degrees and we were all in isolation. And in fact, we turned in we Rob and Carol hit send to the copy editor at Knopf the day Random House shut down the building. Mm. So we often say that like Landslide, it has been literally a test case for a novel that came out in to the day of, of sort of COVID shutting down publishing in a way. Um, and but the themes, those themes of COVID really aren't, they aren't really present in the book. Lily, I don't think they are. Do you? No, but I was thinking how much, you know, without ever saying Trump, without ever um, really alluding to this particular moment, how, how much is kind of in there anyway, you know, N not, not so much the pandemic, but um, just definitely this, this time is there without really you know you know naming it which i really oh, like terrific well um we have a a little uh, surprise here um uh carol baron who susan's editor is is with us and is gonna jump in here really quick carol, carol. you want to unmute yourself um can you let's uh let's see if i can find oh my you. goodness this is truly, truly a surprise. <laughs> I was feeling her. I, was feeling I did it. Carol. Okay, I did it. Now, just to follow up what you said, I think you can hear me. 
it was the pandemic and we were all learning new systems on the computer, like unmute in order to get your galleys and your rewrites all in the right place. It was an experience. But, and to answer your question, Lily, the book has to do with the pandemic in that it has to do with family and caring for people. And no matter what happens, that's where we, we are at. And so, in fact, my favorite takeaway from the book is that it's better to be together than apart. Mm -hmm. This family goes through a lot and it could be anything and yet they come back together. So I wanna take my apple cider sparkling and toast you, Susan and Jill and the boys and that hunk kit and to <laughs> A great beginning. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Carol. Loved you, Richard. Love, Love you, you, Richard. She's thank <laughs> you. God. Okay. So bye, bye. Okay. Bye. 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 Okay. Now I'll do something and get out of here. Right? <laughs> yeah, I think we. I think that's a great. Oh place. yeah, mute. Oh. <laughs> oh, there we go. That's a great, great place to end it. Um, uh, and uh, I want to say one last thank you to Susan and Lily and a huge thank you to Mechanics Hall and Print. And I want to remind people that they should go to Print Bookstore right now and order a copy if they haven't done that already. Um, we'll also send a follow up email with a link to that if you if you need it. Um, Susan, I don't know if you want to say a parting word or two as we head, head on out or Oh, I can just feel um, so many people that I love and care about are in the ether here. And I wish I could hold you all, give you hugs and, and thank you. I can feel you though. Um, and I'm going to get a little weepy, right? We don't get to see each other, um, but I'm just so grateful. And I'm just so grateful that you're reading and that you're supporting art and that you're supporting books. Um, and um, I feel really lucky tonight. So thank you so much, everyone. Wonderful. Thank you all. Take care. Congrats, okay, Susan. Thank you, Susan. Bye, all. Okay, be well. <laughs>